Can we stop the march of the robots? I talk with Freudian psychoanalyst Dr. Philip Hershenfeld and comedian Ethan Hershenfeld, author of Today Is Now. And then the robots are marching, but Americans aren't. I talk with Dr. Harriet Fraud about why Americans seem to put up with so much. On this program, we don't argue. And when views are expressed, especially on Ukraine, views that I might disagree with, it is my job to listen. There is a lot of information, misinformation, and opinion out there. I try to parse as much as I can by bringing people on who I might not always agree with, but I need to hear them in order for you and me to make up our minds. Two weeks ago, on episode 1421, right before the one-year anniversary of the illegal invasion of Ukraine, I spent a good 90 minutes weighing both sides of the argument for and against sending arms to Ukraine. I urge you to listen to episode 1421. It might help you arrive at a position. I don't know what any of the answers are other than war is not one of them. I welcome your thoughts in the comments section down below. A little later on, you will be hearing one of my guests offer up a strong opinion on Ukraine. You will also hear me politely disagree. We don't do screaming and yelling on this program because we don't do certitude. Well, a little certitude. Okay, a lot. Please join me for Office Hours this Friday night. I'm there from 8 till 9.30 Eastern. Go to my website for the link. And while you're over there, please sign up for my newsletter. I have a, I have a solution. Yes. The question you posed is, can we stop the march of the robots and the ascendance of artificial intelligence and the way it impinges on the freedom uh, 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 of humanity. And I say there's a very simple solution. Every time you're prompted by your computer when it asks you, am I a robot? Answer yes. And then you can go undercover. <laughs> and then you can fight them from the inside. That's brilliant. I love it. Okay. That is Ethan Hershenfeld, <laughs> author of Today Is Now. Go buy it on Amazon. And also joining us is Dr. Philip Hershenfeld. He's a Freudian psychoanalyst, and they watched me have a, a minor. Uh, I, I held up okay. I, I would, you, you handled it very well. You, we saw your frustration building, and then we saw you perform what's known in the business of psychological intervention and health as a a timeout. Um, toddlers do it. Um, adults can do it. It's a coping mechanism and you deployed it perfectly. You went, you claimed to be, to be going to get a glass of water. You actually had a slug of whiskey <laughs> in back, and you, you combined the coping mechanism with a little bit of subterfuge of secretly tippling on that Chivas Regal and you did it perfectly. And now look at you. Now look at you. Yeah. I mean, I wanted something. I wanted this technology to work been going on since October and my mind started flashing on everybody else who can get their technology to work and I can't and the rate I, I just have this rage but let's yeah, talk about I have the identical thing and you, you pinpointed exactly what's going on psychologically it's a it's a an unconscious comparison of yourself with everyone else who you imagine does this seamlessly and it, it's just it's a feeling of of impotence that then leads immediately to rage. Impotence to rage. Yes. My, my younger colleague often talks about acceptance. I think you should simply accept that you are cursed. <laughs> How about that? I, you may be right. Okay. And just go with it. Go yeah, with it. it. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't want to relitigate this. I bought a new computer. Okay. But it really is. It is about it's about acceptance and it's about just observing the world as it is, seeing the phenomena that appear before your eyes and before all of your sense fields and just taking kind of getting in the passenger seat instead of behind the wheel for a while. Because often we think we're in the driver's seat, but we're not. Just right. enjoy that you're in the passenger seat, even if the driver is drunk and <laughs> uh, in the wrong lane. Just just enjoy it. Can I say one other thing before we begin? Yes. Doctor, sorry, you were going to say? 
I was going to say, I was going to give an example of this. When David was having his meltdown, I was answering an, a text question, a, a, a survey, how I feel about this New York subway system and uh, on a one to 10. And I gave it a nine. And the guy wrote back, that's great. Why do you give it a nine? And I wrote back, it gets me to my destination without any traffic and cheaply. And I find the rats extremely <laughs> interesting. <laughs> Amenable. That's an example of I, I can't change the rats. <laughs> and, and they are fellow travelers. On this planet. <laughs> And but they're fair. Stomach. They're fair evaders. They go under the turnstile. <laughs> That's also true. But I, I just accept. You know, if I were to get hysterical about the rats, I would have had to give them a two or three. But I don't. <laughs> now, can you can go ahead, Ethan? I wanted to ask. Well, you I'm just going to say for a little bit of context, just in case people don't know. The doctor's commute is exactly 80 feet from his apartment to his office. <laughs> so this is all just a real load of malarkey. But he does take the subway. He can, can, just because he loves that's what she loves it. <laughs> but I see rats on my foot commute, actually. I love them. There was a great article about the rats this week uh, in The New Yorker or in The Times about the question of it was in The Times about viewing them with an ethical eye even though you know that it's sometimes they, they need to be dealt with as a pestilence to not, you know, you don't want to relish in the killing of them or in the suffering. Can, can you try to relate to them as just another creature? And I think that that's critical to, to, to having a well-developed ethical and, and moral sense. They're, they're creatures, they have feelings, they, they have intelligence, they have so, so society, they have family um, and they have a buffet. They're, they've made the whole world their buffet. Which is very impressive. All you can eat buffet. It took us millennia to invent that. The rats had that uh, when they were Neanderthals, still dragging their knuckles across Europe. So they're advanced. Could we be trained to see rats as cute and not? I do see them as cute. You know how they say, like, if you're in a state of anxiety, imagine a person naked. Mm -hmm. You can do the same thing. If you see a rat, imagine it with a bushy tail. That's a squirrel. <laughs> <laughs> Just put some fur on that rat and you're looking at a cute squirrel. But there is some there's a um, biopsychosocial reason that we don't. Namely, um, things with little eyes close together and pointy snouts. We are sort of evolutionarily uh, programmed. To not like things like that. We like That's, things. Now I get it. Now I understand why I didn't like your grandmother. <laughs> <laughs> like, come on. I mean, she was friendly enough, but now I get it. <laughs> no, it's I. It's terrible to speak to speak that way of, of the of the departed. She's still alive. What are you talking about? <laughs> The so so there's some kind of evolutionary mandate that says we can't find a specific type of face or animal cute. We like big eyes, for instance, mm -hmm. little baby, baby, anything's have big eyes. So mm -hmm. that, that somehow is very attractive and pleasing to us. I remember that from biology in college. There's this concept of neoteny growing younger. Yeah, neoteny, it's the neotenic stage in developments when it's like a toddler or a tadpole and they actually have big eyes. And then our professor showed us that you could trace that actual same um, development in uh, Mickey Mouse in the character. Like, really? uh, yeah, you could see the cartoons following the same these same physiological patterns that that somehow trigger this cuteness reaction. That's so it wasn't a thyroid condition. That was a, that was a secondary situation. Uh, is there a reason we should be creeped out by rats other than the way they look? They carry ver they carry disease, right? So do we. Yeah, so do most of my neighbors. <laughs> <laughs> if you had a rat and a cat living in your apartment, which and a hat, and a hat which one would be more likely? to carry disease. 
Well, I think the rats are living, you know, they live in the street and they have to, you know, they don't get their lunch out of like a can or a pouch. I see. Uh, that's been radiated. So they, I think that, yeah, and then their fur and the, the fleas, and then you get the bubonic plague and all that. So yeah, there, uh, I asked this Buddhist monk who I was friendly with, the guy who started that organization, Apopo, that trained these Gambian pouch rats to sniff out TB and TNT. It was, it was this amazing technology. I asked him about this because I was troubled by having to get rid of some mice in the building. And he said, he said, sometimes you got to take off that. He didn't say it like this, but you got to take off that vegan hat or that Buddhist hat and just deal with the fact that these things can carry diseases into your house. So you got to kill them. But you can try to do it in a in a, in a, a less cruel way, in a more humane way. Um, like you can, for example, the most humane way with the rat is you convince it to commit suicide. Mm -hmm. <laughs> OK, I feel better now. This is interesting. We started. I was in a rage because it was technology. We gave you a little humor. Well, I had a human connection, and this is what I wanted to talk about tonight. Artificial intelligence, AI, isolation, and the evolution of our minds. I was watching The Magnificent Ambersands last night on TCM, and it starts where they talking, and it was made in the 30s, uh, 41, 42. It takes place at the turn of the century, and they talk, they talk about what a simpler time it was before the automobile and how people weren't rushed. If you look at the evolution of psychology and psychiatry, do they take into consideration the rewiring of our brains, not just through computers, just through the invention of the buggy whip, simple inventions? Do, do these, does the advancement of science and technology alter our brains? And if you're a psychiatrist or a psychologist, do you have to work through that with your patients? I, I once read somewhere, and I don't remember the exact dates, but the, the author said if a peasant in the fifth century were suddenly transported to the 13th century, he would be able to function perfectly. Nothing would have changed. The same horse, the same plow, the same shitty house. And, um, but the rate of change now is just astronomical. GPT just, just happened, and now everybody's right. crazy about it. It's a great idea for a movie, a guy who time travels, but he arrives at the Middle Ages. Somebody who comes from ancient Rome and shows up around yeah, the time of Chaucer, and he goes, well, it's <laughs> yeah, I'm going back. You were going to say something, Ethan? Oh, um, no. Okay, so what does that do to us psychologically, and is our brain being rewired by technology? Is it changing us? Psychologically? I think physically, does it do the neurons or whatever it is inside I'm, our brain? I'm, I'm getting to that, David. Oh. I, like, I like to have a preamble. <laughs> a little foreplay. <laughs> I think rapid change definitely increases the, the level of stress that we are all living under. Whether it changes our brains, I'm not the one to ask that question to. I am. Oh, <laughs> it's it's not. you have a neurologist, uh, a neurologist and an orthopedist. <laughs> uh, and uh, OK, let me, let me explain what's going on with technology. It's, it's a lot simpler than, than people think. They're trying to understand about the, the changes to the neurons and the changes to the axons and to the gluons and to the pastons and to the snap-ons. But let me explain what's going on. <laughs> Mostly, people hold their phones and they spend a lot of the day in this position with their neck mm -hmm. over, it's flexed into this position. And as a result, apart from the orthopedic changes to the scapula, to the trapezius, to the rhomboids, what's really happening that's really germane to our discussion here is 
the the musculature and the the skeleticature right here <laughs> in the top in the top of the spine is extending to such a de degree that it's actually stretching what's known in this part as the brain stem uh -huh. not, not to be confused with the brain branches which are out here <laughs> that come out by the ears but the brain stem right here it gets elongated and therefore it can take much longer it can take up to two times as long for a, ne a neurological impulse to go from what's called the cortex, which is where your hair is, if you have hair, that's mm -hmm. the cortex. The time it takes to travel from the cortex <laughs> to what's called the coccyx, which is what's your tailbone. That distance, this area right here, which is about halfway between. If you imagine, for example, like let's say you're you're driving mm -hmm. from like the Bronx and the road, they just make the road longer. Yeah, like you're going from, from the Bronx to Newark and let's say you drive there. And then it turns out the restaurant that you used to always go to Newark, it's now in Philadelphia. <laughs> Think about how your day just got ruined. Your day is completely trashed because it's very confusing. You ever try to drive to Philadelphia? There's no signs. They pretend it's not even there. New Jersey pretends that that New Jersey matters. And down there, there's no signs for Philadelphia. That's what all of what's going on with all of these impulses here. So basically it's just a big, it's a big, so it's slowing my face. our thinking down. It's slowing the thinking down and it's, it's, it's getting lost. There's all sorts of ideas. For example, you could have a thought that says I'm hungry. And normally that neuro neurological impulse would travel right down to what's called the stomach. But now it's getting routed here. It's going to your wrist. And now you're feeling hungry in your wrist. <laughs> what's happening to people? <laughs> so your wrist reaches for food, but yeah, you don't or you understand why. Yeah, you see people all day checking their wrists. You think they're checking, looking at their watches. No, they're hungry. They're, they want lunch. <laughs> That's what's happening. It's just a big mess out there. That's what's happening. So um, now if you're tilting your head forward. Yes. You're, the blood is then being pushed to the, the prefrontal it's, cortex. It's going to the pre post nasal cortex and the post nasal that then the dripping begins and if you're leaned over too far then that's why you see so many people walking around with these big swollen you know these big kind of like th these lips those duck lips that you see on the upper east side with a lot of the women these days that's what's happening there and those are ideas that are just leaking out it's because just a big mess it's a big mess. So yeah. we should look at our lean back when we're reading our phone. Lean back, except if, from a dermatological perspective, it's better to be looking down because less less sun on the forehead. So and more on the neck, the back of the neck, though. Well, wear a collared shirt. <laughs> <laughs> I hope I've cleared it up. The relationship. You have. Yeah. You have. You have. Now, have you ever had a dinner party? I, I understand there's somebody else in your family who has a, an MD. Has, have you ever had doctors over where Ethan pretended he was a doctor and joined the conversation? Listen, I don't pretend like this when it's in this situation like that with a bunch of uh, medical professionals. Then I bring a PowerPoint and I really <laughs> know them what's what. I don't just rely on descriptors and pointing. I have an actual, I have charts, graphs, bar graphs, <laughs> diagrams, even videos and a book. I, I could just see you eating dinner with your father and some friends who are, and they don't, they think you're a doctor. And, and as you go, like talking about stretching out the brainstem, they're thinking this guy's a genius. Where, where did he read this? I didn't get this month's Lancet. What is? No, it's um, basically what happened with me was I was pre-med freshman year in college. And then I did a little more of those classes later on in college. And my basic feeling about the whole thing was like, I get all this. I don't need to go to medical school. I, under, I just, I, you know, it's pretty much common sense. So that's why I feel licensed to just explain this <laughs> without any actual training and without a license. <laughs> did you take organic chemistry? In I did. I did take it uh, one summer at Boston College with a terrific professor. He was great. He wore sandals. He was a real hippie. And were you able to master it? No, but uh, but uh, the, the guy I sat next to during the exam. <laughs> <laughs> that's osmosis, right? Yeah. You and also my lab partner, she was very handy with the test tube. So I was I was set. Why is 
organic chemistry. Why is that the make or break for, for doctors? For me, what was it turned out? I just had a complete misunderstanding of what it meant. I thought it meant you take like organs <laughs> animals and then do chemistry on those. That was my problem with it. Mm -hmm. I was trying to do experiments on livers and things. Well, what is it, Dr. Hirschfeld? Is it just memorization? Is uh, that, what is it? Why is it so hard? Memorization, but it's also something that I lack, which is humility. <laughs> the ability to conceptualize three dimensional junk. Because there are all these very complicated amino acids molecules folding and into how they fit together. And right. Yeah. It was right. not my cup of tea. Right. Somehow I got through it, but with a lot of pain. They have 3D modeling now, I've noticed. I'm being serious, where you can, yeah. you can help you visualize yeah. what's going on. I always got, not that I'd even come close to, to being able to do what you know, organic chemistry. I always got lost. But how do they know this? Not like instead of my learning it, I would get hung up on just, the whole time. You're just thinking, really? Come on. How did you figure this out? <laughs> Show me. Show yeah. me. You bet you have to accept things at face value and go, OK, this is the way. A, a virus spreads and this is the way DNA works and, and not ask, well, how did you figure this out? What were the experiments? I have one kid who was able, always able in school to just accept things at face value and say, they would say, this is how it works. And from here, we go ahead. I'm sorry. If you're a little bit paranoid. You can't do that. You can't accept anything. And in order to go to medical, I'm being serious, I'm being serious. In order to learn these things, you have to accept this is the way it is. Unless you want to do all the experiments from the beginning over again to your own satisfaction. And there are people like that. Right. I, I went the, at this the, when I did it at Boston College, they had just instituted in that summer course, uh, a micro organic chemistry lab for environmental reasons. So you weren't huffing large amounts of these byproducts. It was all tiny. And what I proved, this is to your point, David, I don't think any of these things were true. It's either that they weren't true I, or I was just so bad at the lab that at the end of every experiment, when you had to scrape the crystal residue off the bottom of the beaker and then weigh it, every single week, the mass of my uh, yield was zero. <laughs> so I was either disproving all of these laws of chemistry or I just wasn't wasn't handy in the lab. So human civilization advances only if we agree upon some building blocks that cannot be relitigated. We we have to say, OK, new generation here. Here's here's a, a block. Now get on top of this. Just accept this block. Don't question it. And we go from here. And I, I guess because politics is something I'm passionate about, I see where they make these false building blocks that are on pillars of salt. Like right. if you lower taxes for the wealthy, then it, the money trickles down and they create jobs. And, and that is like a building block of economics. That's just a lie. It's if, done. And if it's you're wealthy, if you're wealthy, you accept it. Right. Or, right. or if you're a, if you're a gullible, uh, you know, MAGA. Yeah. Nut. Um, yeah. That's like a, you repeat that same fake building block that, dung building block for 50 years and then people just act like that's the starting point you're absolutely right so watching kids grow watching my kids grow because i was fascinated by what they would accept and and wanting to learn the rules like these are the rules and don't ask us why these rules were made these are the rules and learn the rules a lot of education is learning rules that have been settled before and, and the person who tends to do the best, I think, is somebody who may not be uh, I'm not I'm just making a generalization or somebody who may not be a deep thinker. 
somebody who right who just accepts it and and maybe the person who does genuinely the best is the person who's constantly saying well well how do you know that why don't you prove that to me but if you're doing that you can't learn what you you have to i think you're putting your finger right on the 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 gap between elementary and high school and college and graduate school thinking and learning in the beginning. Yeah. The questioning can be a time waster when you have to get the basics down, but later on, it's all about question. Right. And the whole thing is coming up with creative questions. Gentlemen, I've got to go teach a course now. I thought you just did. Yeah. Right. Well, I got to go teach a a legitimate course. (laughs) Okay. Thank you for putting it later next week. Next week. Thank you for doing that. God bless. Hershenfeld. Let's plug your gigs. How do we do that? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. This is fun. This is happening in 48 hours. This thing is, it's a, it's a comedy show. It's in Bushwick. If you're in the Brooklyn area. Oh, plug or flug or it's on, it's a sun. That's on the 12th. That's on the 12th. But something else came up before that, which sounds pretty darn fun. And let me tell you what it is. It is. It has an occult. It's called Vision Board Comedy Show. It's called Vision Board. It's happening at 730 on Saturday night in Bushwick. And the the venue is called, oh, it's at 6 Wyckoff Avenue in Brooklyn. Oh, the Cobra Club. There, it's easy to remember. At the Cobra Club at 730 on Saturday night. The Cobra Club. Come to a comedy show. I'm on the bill. A metaphysical journey. Psychic reading. Stand-up comedy. They, there's going to be a little occult. There's some very funny comedians on the bill, including Jessica Brodkin and Jess Solomon. Jess Solomon. So some very funny people. Fantastic. And uh, comedy. That's just 48 hours from now. Holy mackerel. And by today is now. By today is now. Or just think about it. Just think <laughs> about it. And let the, it, the energy of what I wrote and thought about will just flow into you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Stay stay put for one second. Okay. Joining us is Dr. Harriet Fraud. Thank God. And that should be the name of your other podcast. It's Thank Fraud. Fraud. We'll have it. Thank (laughs) Fraud. She is the host of Capitalism Hits Home. It's not just in your head is another podcast. And you can listen to her if you're in New York City on WBAI. And I believe it's Tuesday nights or Tuesday after. Tuesday nights at 6.30. That's it. On WBAI. Let's talk about abortion and passivity. The French, the yellow Mm -hmm. vests, they take to the streets. I wrote about this in my newsletter, how the French view shutting the economy down like the weather, you know, no. Okay. I I was going to go shopping today, but there's a strike. I'll do it tomorrow. Exactly. Exactly. The thought of a massive strike in this country, I I, I crunched the numbers out of something like a hundred and let's say 130 million workers in America, 220,000 last year went on strike. That's nothing. But compared to our past, it was amazing. Our recent past, you know, ever since the McCarthy era, when they threw the left out of the unions, they lost the spark of the unions and it's just been reignited. So labor is starting again in the United States. But because they threw, you know, Philip Murray, I think his name was the head of the AFL, went along with Joseph McCarthy and threw all the leftists out of the unions. And the leftists with the vision of workers' power were what made the unions vital. And so by throwing them out and hounding them out, they took the spark out of the labor movement, which then went from 35% of all workers to 9% of all workers. Ouch! And without the passion that it had. And that was a, a terrible, terrible thing to happen. And only now is it being undone when they can't threaten people with being called a communist and have them be ostracized or deported or whatever, you know, there's, but it did 
terrible damage to worker militancy. And this is a conversation that we don't have in mainstream media. There's the fear of communists taking over uh, labor unions. You taught us that thanks to maybe Taft-Hartley, it's against the law for a union to have a leader who's a member of the Communist Party. That's crazy. Constitutional. People say, oh, communism, you know, the communists are going to take over the unions. But we don't hear about fascism. How are unions treated in a fascist state? They're eliminated. One of the first things, in fact, that Zelensky did was stop all unions. You know, even the head of the AFL came out against that. When you have a fascist takeover, an authoritarian leader like Hitler or like Zelensky in Ukraine, you immediately abolish unions. And that's what he did. You're saying he's a fascist. Yeah, I think he is. He's willing to level his whole country to fit the U.S. agenda. I mean, I think it's horrendous. He wouldn't be. All the Russians wanted at first was just in their constitution that they are neutral, that they don't sign up with NATO or anybody else, but they're neutral since they share 1,200 miles of the border of Russia. But Zelensky did America's bidding there because America wanted a week in Russia. I think it was a failing strategy on the U.S. part. I think both Russia and the U.S. failed. The Russians thought they'd just plow over you, uh, <laughs> plow over the Ukraine and they'd win. But they didn't understand that Americans had been training Ukrainian soldiers since 2014 and were heavily arming them. And the U.S. thought that the sanctions in Russia would destroy the Russian economy and they could take over with their European allies and carve Russia up. Because, look, Russia has the most natural resources in the world and the biggest landmass. China has the most people and is most technologically advanced. And they thought they would stop that unity, and carve up Russia to their own being because it would collapse, the way Yeltsin started to do once um, Gorbachev stepped out. So that what you, they failed. Both sides misperceived what was going to happen. And of course, the sanctions didn't hurt Russia that much. The Russian economy is growing better than the U.S. economy, and they are selling their oil and gas very profitably to China and India, who are then reselling it at a higher price, contributing to the inflation. And Americans are contributing with our insistence on that war in Ukraine. We're furthering destroying the globe because obviously wars create quite a bit of gunfire, bombs, pollution. And secondly, we're, you know, risking world war. And thirdly, we're destroying a whole nation in rubble. And the U.S. then has threatened Russia and said, we will then take all the resources that Russians have invested in the United States. And the Russians said, OK, we'll do the same for Russia. So your oligarchs will be feeling uncomfortable, too. OK, it's not as, you know, the United States can't dictate to the world the way it did after World War II. Other economies have risen. The power has shifted. And, you know, Americans are very passive. Well, let me, we're going to switch gears here and talk about, let me just address what you said. I am not going to argue with you. I disagree with you. But Fine. Yeah, and I don't want to get into an argument. I just want to say that on this show, uh, we don't do arguments. We do information and we try to hear both sides, if both sides are worthy of being heard. Good idea. And, and there is a, a segment, uh, an, uh, an anti-war segment uh, on the left that, like you, that, that aren't running a scam and they, and they need to be heard. Uh, I, do, I do disagree with the characterization of Zelensky as, as a fascist. I, I, I think after the invasion... Uh, you know, Lincoln suspended habeas corpus during the Civil War. I th- I'm not being an apologist for the the behavior of a commander in chief during war, but Roosevelt rounded up the Japanese. That was horrible. Was be- horrible. Uh, but you know, uh, but but nothing. It was wrong during wartime. 
people uh, make horrible mistakes. Yes, and, I agree. And, and so uh, I don't think Putin had any right to invade a sovereign nation. I think that, that's uh, and had there been genocide going on in the Donbass, that is a separate issue. But he didn't really talk about genocide. He talked about denazification, not so if there was no genocide going on in, in the Donbass, I, I find it it's hard to justify uh, his violation the, 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 yes. of the nation. So, well, I think one of the things that's a problem is that the Russians made, I, am, I hold no brief for Putin. He's a despicable misogynist. He's homophobic and dictatorial. However, I mean, when... Khrushchev was going to have a an army base and a missile base in Cuba, ninety miles from our border, not in California, you know, not in Mexico on our border. We threatened World War Three because it was ninety miles from home. This Ukraine is on twelve to fourteen hundred miles of Russia's border, and they warned us many times, and our ambassadors conveyed that warning that there's a red line in the sand. We've already gotten into NATO, all the surrounding former socialist Soviet republics. And that is a threat to their sovereignty. And there's no question of that. And they threatened they would invade. I think there should be other means besides invasion. I think invasions are terrible. The civilian population always pays, no matter what geopolitical games are being fought. But I also think that that's the other, the two sides have to be presented and our media doesn't do that. Okay, so I'm not going to, I'm genuinely curious as to why some people think the way they do. So let me ask you a probative question and it's not to be argumentative. Has NATO ever invaded a former Eastern Bloc country? Well, it's interesting. There was a correspondence between Hillary Clinton and Victoria Newall about unseating the pro-Russian. There was an invasion, but with the work of the CIA and others, they unseated the pro-Russian leader of Ukraine. And Victoria Newhall says, let's put in the clown because Zelensky is a comic. And Hillary Clinton agreed. So it wasn't the kind of invasion of troops, but it certainly was a CIA takeover, which we've done in many countries like Chile when Allende was killed and so on. So, you know, you don't have to have an army invasion to invade the sovereignty of another nation and um, try to arrange for the assassination of its leader. And so we did interfere for sure. And I think that the Russians are very sensitive. I mean, the Germans invaded. So sending German tanks around Russia is pretty scary for them. They lost 30 million people and in World War II. And they were also invaded by the U.S. and Germany and where was it? England. They were invaded, but and Japan. Four countries invaded the Soviet Union in 1917 to stop their revolution, in league with the White Russians against the Red Russians. And so they've had their taste of invasions, and they're very wary of them. But they've also Russia's also invaded Poland and Finland and Czechoslovakia, Crimea, Czechoslovakia, Hungary. Well, those were all deals in World War II where the U.S. and Russia carved up the world after World War II because they were the winners. Right. So that was a deal made with the United States. Who gets what? And they got those Soviet republics and were dictatorial there. So you know? let's let's let me just say again that uh, we don't argue on this show. I like to hear both sides. I. Uh, Personally, my, my opinion is that once you violate the sovereignty of a nation by uh, bombing it and committing war crimes the way Putin has, uh, yes, there's no question 
that the Maidan uprising seems to have been manipulated by Victoria Nuland and, and Hillary Clinton and the CIA, and they they got Yanukovych to to get out of there. Yeah, but we didn't commit war crimes. Uh, there, yes, uh, right. We, did. we didn't directly do that. We don't directly do it. Well, no, and Chile. I mean Chile, were, were, there were war crimes. Yes, I'm not seeing the kind of war crimes that America committed in Ukraine that Putin is committing. No, I think the Russian army has committed war crimes, but I think the Ukrainian armies have also committed war crimes. I think when you have a war, that's what you get. And it's pretty horrible. But but the Ukrainians were invaded. They were invaded by Russia, there's no question. So the, the And it was provoked by the United States government that wanted to interrupt the Chinese Russian alliance and carve up Russia. That failed, but uh, that was the point. And the Russians thought they could roll right over the Ukrainians, and that failed. Well, you know, I remember when Zbigniew Brzezinski, Jimmy Carter's national security advisor, tried to take credit for tricking the Soviet Union into invading Afghanistan and putting them in a quagmire as bad as Vietnam. And one reading of history is that that's what brought down the Soviet Union. Yeah. The, the invasion of Afghanistan. So the idea that the CIA and Jimmy Carter and Zbigniew Brzezinski were manipulating uh, who was in charge in Kabul to trick uh, Russia into invading. But Russia invaded. Russia was the one who invaded. That's right. And when we invaded Afghanistan, it started to destroy our empire. And when right. the British invaded Afghanistan, it brought down their empire. You'd think these empires would catch on. It's the graveyard of empires. But eventually you, you have to say what you can look at bad behavior, but some behavior is worse than. Yes. Others. An invasion is terrible behavior. Right. And our invasion of Vietnam and Korea and Afghanistan and Iraq were invasions and they were terrible. And the Russians' invasion of Ukraine is terrible. Understandable, yes. They're not going across the world. They're at right. their border. But nonetheless, there's got to be another way. And even if America tricked them, America tricked them into that invasion, they shouldn't have been tricked. It was a terrible thing. Right. But, uh, you know, Biden uh, uh, arming the uh, arming the Ukrainians and saying he's going to invade, he's going to invade and secretly hoping he's going to invade so you can sell more weapons to the Ukrainians is bad, but not as bad as actually invading. And I, th I, I think in the end, America has lost its moral authority, as yes. has Russia, as yes. has China. And I listen to the UN. They have a socialist, Guterres, who's in charge of the UN now, he's not blaming the United States. He's blaming Russia for the humanitarian crisis. At some point, you have to rely on world bodies like the International Criminal Court, which America will not be a member of. But in the end, you have to trust the people whose job it is to uh, be on the ground with their blue helmets and observe. I don't think the UN is observing, but I trust the UN and I trust Guterres and the Secretary General. In the end, if you're looking at it at, you know, 33,000 feet from above, you see an invasion. And yes, that, you do. And, that, and that's where you say, okay, whatever happened before the invasion was tragic and wrong. And provocation. But you don't. Invade. I could see that. And I condemned the invasions of Iraq, the invasion of Afghanistan, the invasion of Vietnam and the invasion of Korea on the U.S. part. And I think the Russians are understa were understandable and provoked, but they're the ones that invaded. And they then that is a terrible crime to invade. And civilians always get killed, as they have in all of our invasions. Right. But I think the United States is hardly in a position to be condemning invasions since we've invaded four other countries lately, you know? Yeah. 
Right. But just because we've lost our moral authority doesn't mean they should. Absolutely. I agree with you. I don't know what they could have done, but they should have found some other solution. Yeah. And there should be peace talks. You should be begging for peace. You know, our our economy is so much larger than Russia's. And then when you tack on the EU, we're the bigger person. So you beg, you get, you drop to your knees and beg for peace. And you don't engineer the invasion in the first place because you think you can carve up that country and resuscitate the EU and the failing U.S. economy that way. That's not a good idea. When you say engineering, you mean tricking him? No, I mean replacing a pro-Russian with someone who does America's bidding. Right. And I think also training starting in 2014 with the Maidan agreement, the United States violated the agreement and it started training Ukrainian soldiers and equipping them, getting ready so that they could be used. And I, you know, the U.S. wants to fight to the last Ukrainian or Ukrainians, you know, and I think that's immoral. But I do think once you've invaded, it's blood on your hands. Right. Well, let's talk about the passivity of uh, us, Americans. Yes. We sure are bellicose and belligerent and love war and are willing to spend billions to see bombs dropped on Ukraine. But, uh, you know, when it comes to taking care of ourselves, we we we, we almost through our passivity bomb ourselves. What's going we on do. with Walgreens and abortion? And Well, with Walgreens, what happened was that the right wing threatened Walgreens. If you even though it's perfectly legal, if you sell the abortion drugs, you will regret it. And so they decided, okay, we'll fold. And there was no protest outside. There may be people are trying to organize one now, but there was no protest. There were no flyers being given. Boycott Walgreens and why? They just, and Americans aren't out there protesting. That there is what you reported on the 4 million people in the streets of Paris because their retirement age was going to be moved up. And I, I say to myself, what happened? And I think what happened is a lot of things. One is the McCarthy era knocked out the left and made it criminal to be a leftist. And it's the left that organized protests against capitalism. And so we missed out. And it's the left that is the militancy in unions. We missed out. And I think that also another thing happened. Well, there's two more things that are important. One is that in the late 70s, those companies that were allowed to outsource to cheaper places, because we don't have a militant left movement, I should say that in Scandinavia, you're not allowed to outsource without finding a job for every single person in your employ and a job of equal pay. And you don't have to have representatives of the neighborhood affected because, of course, you outsource a whole town can be destroyed, and of the labor unions, because we haven't had a left to fight for them, right? Mm -hmm. So once you outsource millions of well-paid union jobs and forced women into employment to keep some standard of living, those people who made multi-billions by outsourcing brought their money home and bought our political system. Because unlike Germany, or France or all the Scandinavian countries or Holland, they don't allow any private money in elections. Oh, we do. And then with Citizens United, you can buy, you can buy our electoral system. And the Americans were not organized to fight back. They just felt their voices didn't count. And you know why? Because they didn't. Because in order to run, you have to raise billions of dollars and you have to pay off who's ever giving you those billions of dollars. And so I think Americans were just in day's despair, sat around watching TV, eating horrible, fattening food, getting fat and getting dumbed down. The Communist Party was wiped out. The Socialist Parties, both of them were wiped out. And the left was wiped out. And all you had was the right wing, a kind of fascistic Trump-like complaint, which keeps the corporations intact. And I think Americans are not as stupid as they may appear, because I think they understand that whether it's a Republican or a Democrat, 
Those corporations that control things that don't have to run in public are always the same. And the way things stand now, they don't stand a chance. That's the way I think people feel. Although I do think if people got organized and had a general strike, they would have a chance. Yes. But they feel like they don't have a chance. Their voices don't count. I even remember hearing an interview with one of Trump's supporters in a rally down in the South. And they said, do you really think he'll bring your factory job back? He said, of course not. But he's angry like us. He talks to my anger. Right. So, of course, he won't do it. But they're lost. They're angry. And they don't have a, an organized political place to go. Right. You know, if you were angry during the early 70s and the late 60s, you could join the anti-war in Vietnam groups and you could work against urban renewal and gentrification and everything because it was a place to go. Americans don't have a place to go for an alternative. And so they become passive and discouraged and take out their violence personally, which is why, you know, we have the most mass murders times seven, the most of any other country in the world, because people are upset and guns sell well. You know, people are upset and, and desperate and they don't know what to do. And so they're passive. They don't have an organized alternative voice the way they do in France with Mélenchon, their leader, and also which unified everybody, climate, fuel, unions, feminists, people who want racial justice, ethnic groups, everything under one banner that we've got more in common than we do separates us, join us. You know, that's why they won in Chile. That's why they won in Colombia. That's why they won abortion in Argentina, even a Catholic country. That's, you know, that's why they made such gains in France. We don't have that. And so without an alternative, people feel hopeless. Right. Do you think, and passive. do you think the people at the top, and I'm not trafficking in conspiracies. I think this is human nature. I believe the people at the tippy top think, mm -hmm. let them all kill each other down there. Give them guns, give them bad food, let them fight among themselves. As long as they're killing each other, they're not killing us. So just dump as many weapons as you can into the communities. And I, I don't have to worry. I'm in a gated community. I have my own right. guards. I think they believe that. I think they genuinely hate humanity at the time. I think they might be indifferent to humanity. You and I always differ on this. I don't think they think let them kill each other. I just think they think guns sell. So of course you have guns, they sell. And that you think that selling is the holy grail and accumulating more is your purpose in life because it means you're a winner. And that's all they want to do. And they don't feel strongly about the guns because actually guns are selling. You know, that there is a kind of Worship of accumulating more, more than there is a worship of life or a respect for life. I know we're out of time. I'm reading Peter Baker's book about uh, that he wrote with his wife. I think her name is Glassman uh, about the Trump years. Great book. Really great. And there's a chapter on Jeff Sessions and Bridget. I want to say Bridget Nielsen, the head of Homeland Security. She mm -hmm. Ellie. I, I don't know if her name was Bridget Nielsen, but the the myth was that Trump was pained by the separation of mothers from their children at the border. And that's not true. That Jeff, no, of course not. <laughs> Jeff Sessions, the attorney general, there are memos, emails, conversations where they delighted in separating the mothers from their children at the border. That was the plan. It wasn't an accidental byproduct of the immigration policy. That was the policy to separate mothers from their children, to signal to the rest of the world, don't come here. So I think we're dealing with a level of sadism and cruelty that is on par with what you see in I'm not going to bring up a, a certain party that rose in 1933 in Germany, but... Yes, I think you do foster sadism, and I think it's all instrumental. You want to discourage 
refugees from thinking they have a refuge here. Right. And so you lose all compassion. But these are people who are detached from compassion in any case. You're there isn't there. a sense of that. How big a leap is it to not caring about the suffering of others? I remember a friend of mine asked John Kerry in 2004 after he lost to George W. Bush. And, and my friend said, you know, you debated the guy three times. You, you know the guy. How can he live with himself after what's going on in Iraq? And John Kerry said he doesn't care. Right. They just he and Dick Cheney just don't care that. So what we had a, a Republican administration in 2000, 2000, up until 2008, that just didn't care. Right. About other people. And That's then, right. How far a leap is it to sadism from from not caring to the sadism? To enjoying to enjoy, torture. How far a leap is that? Not too far a leap. And it does begin and end, I think, with care. And one of the reasons that women aren't out there shooting people, 99.3% of violent crime is done by men, and 97% um, of the mass murders, is that women, even if you don't have children, from the time you're little, you're supposed to care. You're supposed to care about the house and maintain it. You're supposed to care for babies and you play with dolls. You're supposed to be caring about other people. You're not supposed to be the tough one in charge. You're supposed to be caring, and care is the basis of it. Yep. It's the basis of all caring labor, which is so utterly devalued in the United States. You know, the nurse's aid is paid terribly, and so is the home health worker, and so is the daycare worker, all these caring jobs. The psychiatrist is paid very well. But the social worker who does most of the real care is not, of course. I was reading somewhere, I don't know where, but when we discovered fire, uh, it made our brains bigger hmm. because we were eating cooked food. So, so we didn't, have, our stomachs didn't have to work that hard and all the energy went to our brains and our kids got bigger and bigger heads, but women's reproductive uh, organs remain the same. And passing ahead through the uh, down there, yeah, the vagina. W women can't. Is that what it's called? I, I don't, uh, yeah, the vagina. Okay, uh, that women uh, humans are w one of the few animals that cannot deliver a, a baby by itself. I mean, it's, you can, but a yeah. woman a woman needs another human to help her deliver a child for the most part. I know my grandmother in Eastern Europe was probably, I'm sure her mother just squatted in the field picking right. potatoes and then went back to work. But for the most part, humans need other humans to bring to help world. And I think that's what makes women having, have a keener understanding of community. You, you just, yes. It would also, you know, we, we are social creatures. Our brains develop through social connection, through emotional and social connection, as well as nutrition, right? And we are taught to be the connectors. We're not supposed to be the rugged individuals out there plowing people down. And they had they, the studies that they did for flight and flight, fight and flight. When they did them for women, they were not the same. It was freeze and connect before flight. Wow. Because I think... Women understand that their primary emotional relationship is often with another woman who's a friend or a daughter, not with the man they're married to who have been programmed not to be emotionally available as if it's a weakness. Right. And that's, you know, it's a terrible blight on men not to have their feelings. And it means that you turn off to other people, particularly when you're angry, you don't care. And caring labor is what creates life, whether you're being delivered, you know, you have a midwife deliver you, or whether you take care of a home, you take care of the conditions of life. Right. And, and that's a real deficit. It's what Jacinda Ardern tried to counteract with her valuation. It's not equal value for equal work, the same work. It's equally valuable work. And maintaining life is valuable. 
Dr. Harriet Fraud, we love you. Thank you. Love you too. Papa, <laughs> Dr. Fraud on Twitter at Harriet Fraud. And she hosts two podcasts. We'll get the names of the people you host them with. Uh, there's Yes. Them hits it's, home, and it's not just in your head. And in it's not just in your head is with Liam Tate and E. Coy Hero. And I'm not on Twitter, but um, I am on email and I have my website, HarrietFraud.com. And I'm on WBAI Interpersonal Update, 6.30 Tuesday nights. Fantastic. Thank you. Talk to you next week. Thank you. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.